Good afternoon, everyone. We'll let uh, folks continue logging in for another minute or two, and then we'll get this lunchtime session started. Thanks for joining us and for your patience. All right, I'm going to get us started because I have a few reminders here and I know a few uh, folks may be grabbing their lunch or logging in, but um, welcome to our Wednesday lunchtime session of the National Capital Area Chapters 2021 Virtual Conference. My name is Kayla Anthony. I am the Vice President of Membership for our chapter, um, and it's my pleasure to serve as this session's host alongside my colleague, Clark Larson, who is in the background, but here supporting nonetheless. Uh, I wanna welcome you to this session, um, this chapter conference session titled The Path to Community Engagement, The Road Best Traveled. Um, and here for this session, we have colleagues from the DC Office of Planning, Deborah Crane Kemp, Faith Broderick, and Ashley Stevens. So we're excited to hear from them. Uh, before we dive in, I'm gonna give you just a couple of reminders uh, about the session as a whole. So this session is being recorded and it will be made available uh, for you to view on demand after the, the chapter conference, though um, I see we have a good number of participants logged in, so that's exciting to see it here live. In addition to live conference sessions like this one, there's also nine additional sessions that were pre-recorded as part of this conference, um, and those can also be viewed at your leisure, whether you're on your commute, um, at home, at the park. Um, so that link is gonna be posted. It is already posted to our website, our Twitter, and I'll also put it um, in the chat here for everyone um, to have. It'll be on our, our YouTube channel. Uh, second, if you're on Twitter, I just ask that you uh, give us a follow. We're trying to engage there with real-time content, um, but we're also giving away copies of um, our keynote speaker, Alana Pruce's book, Recast Your City. So if you join us over there, stay tuned later today, there'll be one final uh, chance to win a copy of her book. We've already given two away this week. So, um, And then lastly, before handing it over, I just want to kind of um, make a quick note. So our, our chapter has uh, more than 800 members across this DC Metro, um, including our service area, which is DC, uh, Prince George's County and Montgomery County, but we also have professionals that join us from broader parts of Virginia and Maryland. Um, and our mission is really to serve you and your professional interests in a comprehensive and also a diverse way right here in our at, at the local level. Um, and so what that means is that we need your help. Uh, so we want to hear from you about what you like and what you don't like, uh, but we also want to involve you and we want to involve you as much as you're willing to. Our board is entirely comprised of volunteer chapter members um, that put on events like this. Um, we do that because we want to see the planning profession in this area thrive. And um, it's a great way to network across the region. We get to meet other planners. We also get to set the tone for some of the initiatives um, and learning opportunities that happen in the region. So if that's something that interests you, um, I would encourage you to please reach out to me or one of the other board members that you've um, seen or interacted with throughout this conference. Uh, just to learn more, no pressure, we'll talk to you about what some of the opportunities look like um, and then see if there's a way to get you involved in a more robust way. So thank you for indulging me for just a minute. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Deborah and her colleagues from the Office of Planning, and um, I'll be hanging out in the background to help with any tech pieces you may need. So Deborah. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Clark. Everyone who's out there during your lunch break, thank you for joining us today. We want to welcome you. And I'd first like to introduce my colleagues here at the DC Office of Planning. To my right is Faith Broderick. She's a program manager 
Yep, I'm a, a community planner with uh, Office of Planning, and I'm a project manager for um, two different small area plans that um, are ongoing in our office. And to my left is Ashley Stevens. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Ashley Stevens, um, community engagement coordinator. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to invite you to write questions down uh, or put in the Q and A section of the Zoom. Any thoughts, comments, um, uh, responses to what we're presenting here today? Um, we find that this is a great honor for us to join you here today to share our experiences and lessons learned on our path to community engagement. So today, here's what we will cover. We're going to talk about uh, our OP engagement approach. Under that, we're going to talk about our guiding principles, um, our engagement tools, building an engagement team, and also skills of engagement. And then we'll talk about engagement tools, what's working virtually, what's working on the ground. We'll talk about highlighting some of our engagement tactics and how we use community partners, our, our path to, to youth engagement, and also how we use institutions such as uh, universities and other anchor institutions to support our engagement. And then we want this, as we're talking about engagement, to be very engaging. So we want to hear from you. So we have a let's talk section where we will talk about how you do engagement, uh, what strategies you use, and um, just a back and forth of how, um, how these things have worked and how they, they haven't worked. And then finally, we will have a, a Q&A session where again, um, any thoughts that you have, um, any lessons learned you might wanna share, it'll be open to you at that time. And we do have a slide where we will, um, if possible, drop into the chat, chat but certainly um, share with you some planning resources that we have found very helpful. So um, about OP's engagement approach, um, we have worked or investigated basically uh, definition of engagement. So I, I thought the one that's most appropriate for today, and I actually am gonna take this off a little bit. It's kind of quiet. We have stuff in my ear. Uh, okay, great, thank you. So in doing a little bit of research about engagement, I found that Bang the Table has a virtual, it's a virtual engagement platform and resource, and they share this definition of community engagement. They say, although there is no commonly agreed to community engagement definition, and the use of the term varies widely, sharing the notions of consultation, participation, collaboration, and empowerment, community engagement captures its meaning in mutual decision-making. People, governments, and organizations work collaboratively, co collaboratively to create and realize sustainable visions for their community's future. For governments and organizations, it's about working with and listening to communities to build long-term relationships and develop meaningful solutions to complex issues. By deepening these relationships, ideally, the value of inclusivity is central, where government entities can create dialogue with the very diversity of their with the very diversity of their communities. A more formalized approach to engaging the community has emerged in the public and private sector. Um, positions such as uh, community engagement officer, community engagement specialist, or manager of engagement, engagement leader, all of these are now surfacing because as organizations, as municipalities, as jurisdictions, we realize the importance of engagement in doing our work and how we can and need to effectively continue to engage the community. So we have worked together to look at how we as an agency can better engage the community. Uh, our goal, I think this is the next slide. Our goal was to formalize engagement and be intentional about standard, standardizing our message, formalizing our practice of engagement to reduce if not eliminate barriers to participation and to ensure racial equity. To achieve these goals, we established the following, what you see here on the slide, guiding principles of engagement. So we established an engagement practice, 
We identified dedicated staff for this engagement practice. We standardized how we engage and conduct engagement with from our agency citywide. We focus on racial equity citywide. And also we created a public participation, public participation plan to be used internally by the Office of Planning staff and especially with the Neighborhood Planning Division. Um, we're also drafting public facing collateral so that we can share with the community our engagement practice, our thoughts on engagement, and to um, be transparent as well as accountability as to how we do engagement. So looking at these guiding principles, uh, we want to deliver a transparent and open message that acknowledges, listens to, and responds to community voices. We also want to work collaboratively to rebuild, to build a racial, racially equitable and easily accessible process. We also want to remove barriers to engagement by developing a broad range of digital, in-person, and analog formats for inclusivity. And we want to provide an account of expressed desires, aspirations, and concerns that come from the community through this process. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Uh, some of the engagement tools that we have used um, in, we include our project managers, especially because our office does on the ground planning, geographically based or corridor based planning. And in scoping how these plans will work and be introduced or involve the community, we want to have standardized uh, processes that we use. So the public participation plan helps us uh, stay on track. It's very organic. So if something could work better, it's easily adjustable. So this is the responsibility of the internal engagement team. And that includes the principles of the engagement practice, as well as our project managers and other supporting staff. Uh, we also have online engagement tools. And these were very important and critical, especially as the pandemic uh, raged during the last almost two years. So we were able to go virtual and have dedicated websites, uh, digital survey instruments, as well as virtual meeting tools. We also did, we also did um, as it got safer to go into the community, partnered with our, our community-based organizations and uh, stakeholders to do pop-ups. So we didn't necessarily create our own meetings, but we did piggyback on things that were happening in the neighborhood. Uh, but we also availed ourselves to conduct um, extra times where we were available to the, to the community on um, an on the ground basis. We rely heavily on social media. The Office of Planning has uh, communications staff and we use um, Instagram and other social media outlets to get our messaging out and give updates uh, on what we do as an agency and through our planning processes. We created something called a meeting in a box. So if an organization, advisory neighborhood commissioners in DC want to present on any given plan, we can load that box with the appropriate materials and provide that specifically to the group that wants to use it so that everybody is speaking on the same language and speaking from the same page. Um, we have used creative placemaking uh, and activations to also uh, bring attention to the work that we're doing in the community. Uh, creative placemaking works with local artists, um, uh, community-based uh, arts organizations to do murals, signage, branding in a community, we also do short-term activations. Um, Faith will probably share with you an, um, an alley activation um, and other things in uh, the planning area that she's working with. And we are establishing a lending library. So when community-based organizations want to uh, create their own events around either our planning efforts or other community-based efforts, we can share with them tools to do this, such as lighting, um, seating, um, and other things that community-based groups don't always have. So our community partnerships are very, very important to us and they help us um, um, increase the participation in our planning activities through outreach, also canvassing just folks on the street that may not know about, they're not in the regular uh, uh, vein of, of communication through their local 
block club or a neighborhood organization. So we will literally work with just talking to people on the street and meeting them where they are. And we also conduct focus groups for various demographics, specifically youth groups, and that's been very successful. Um, so we can go to the next slide because I will go more time. <laughs> Okay, so part of what Debbie um, has outlined for us is how we think about building out our engagement team. Um, so in our office, we really try to center community and all the different engagement tactics and tools that we do. Um, so in the circle to the right, you'll see the community is really at the center of all of our engagement. Um, but like Debbie said, we also have an OP um, project team and an OP internal engagement team. And so what that looks like is we work across the entire office to determine who knows the area that we're planning in best, who can best assist with community engagement, and who can best assist with data collection. So we're building out that OP team. Um, simultaneously, we're also building out community partners. Um, so oftentimes we've worked with communities before at different levels of, it, of, of planning, whether it's at the citywide level or more of the block and corridor level. Um, but regardless, we want to build out a community, uh, a, a group of community partners that are leaders, that are stakeholders, that are really invested in that community, in that area, um, to be able to provide incredible guidance, leadership, um, and, and just be thought partners in the planning work that we're doing. We're also always building out our um, interagency partners um, for folks who have ever worked with DC government or worked for DC government, you know we are very large um, and the Office of Planning can't do everything and doesn't do everything. Um, oftentimes a lot of what we hear um, in our planning work um, touches other agencies and so it's really important for us to be on the same page with our agency partners. Um, they provide a lot of incredible um, data and, and updates about the, the work that we're doing um, in certain areas, um, but also we can piggyback on some of the community outreach that they're doing so that we're not um, doing anything redundant um, or and or taking up more time from community members who we know are already strapped uh, with time. Um, we also try to bring on engagement consultants. Um, we've noticed that um, while uh, there's, all, there's a few of us in the office planning that do a lot of engagement, having engagement consultants on board um, really help um, add capacity to the work that we do and really can help lead a, a excellent facilitation um, and, and conversations with community members. Um, and then last but not least, when we're able to, we try to work with um, universities and or anchor institutions that are in the planning areas that we're working with. Um, again, that's a, another way for us to build capacity with the engagement work that we're doing. Um, they bring new ideas to the table. Um, and oftentimes they have other relationships with the community that we're not able to, to create. Um, and so it, it's really um, a nice complement to the work that we do. So then, like Debbie said, we have different scales of engagement. So um, we do planning at the citywide level. Um, we have a comprehensive plan that um, has been um, amended uh, recently, um, as well as other citywide initiatives. Um, so we, when we do planning work at the citywide level, we're trying to touch every single ward of the district. We then have, we do planning at the planning area level, which is more that ward-based level. Um, so it's a little bit more um, central and a little bit more neighborhood-based. Um, then after that, we have the neighbor, the actual neighborhood level planning that we do, um, which includes small area plans, design guidelines, and public life studies. Um, oftentimes, that's looking at just a smaller geography um, and, and a handful of neighborhoods rather than an entire ward. Um, and then our smallest geography in which we do planning is at the site-specific level. Um, and so then those are projects that are typically reviewed in our office um, for alignment with zoning and or historic preservation. Um, this team in particular does a lot of work at the citywide planning and neighborhood level. Um, and we also do help out with some of the site-specific conversations because we work with communities so often. Um, but today we're going to talk a lot about um, the engagement tools and tactics that we deployed at the citywide planning and neighborhood level specifically. Um, so what I'm going to go through now are just some engagement tools that we've deployed um, over the past two years, really, um, on the virtual front and then on the in-person front. Great. Um, so from a virtual engagement standpoint, I'm sure all of us have been scratching our heads and trying to think about all the different um, types of virtual engagement tools that are out there. Um, there's a ton, and these two in particular have done an incredible amount of research um, to figure out what are the best engagement tools that our office can deploy. Um, going into the pandemic um, last, I, I guess, I don't even know what, what year it is anymore, but the February <laughs> before the pandemic, um, we started bringing on public input as our virtual engagement tool. Um, we, this is not a sale for public input, but they've been really great for us. Um, what this tool allows us to do um, is sort of, a, it's an all-in-one virtual engagement platform. So public input has allowed us to create um, dynamic um, web faces and interfaces. Um, we're, allowed, we're able to do virtual surveys through this platform um, where we're able to do interactive mapping. We're able to ask folks to upload photos um, so that we can understand from individual context 
what issues or challenges folks are facing on the ground. Um, we're able to run dynamic reporting out of the virtual surveys that we do. Um, we're also able to take those online surveys, trans um, make them into paper surveys, bring them out in, during community canvassing, like Debbie said, and get feedback that way. Um, and we're also able to um, create sort of an open forum. So all of the survey questions that we have on public input, folks can provide comment, provide responses. Um, and if I'm a community member and I really like the response that Debbie provided to a comment, I'm able to upvote it and respond directly to her. So we're able to create some hopefully more organic and dynamic um, conversations that happen online. This webpage also allows us to do and host all of our own public meetings, which has been really helpful. Um, so while we sometimes host meetings on different platforms like WebEx or Zoom or what have you, um, we're also able to broad, broadcast all those conversations online, um, which means that they, they're saved online, they're transcribed online, um, and folks can go back if they miss a meeting at you know, 7 o'clock on a Tuesday, they can go back the next day and, and rewatch it um, and, and provide comments during that time. Um, the web page also has a CRM, so um, a shared um, communications or community um, relationship manager, rather, um, where if I'm really, really interested in one of the plans that we're doing, um, we have one that's going on in Congress Heights. If I'm a Congress Heights resident, I can sign up. I can be part of the Congress Heights community um, small area plan listserv. I'm able to get information about upcoming meetings. I'm able to get information about surveys um, and other um, uh, information that's really relevant to the, the study itself. Um, so it's been great in terms of email communication, but it's also um, a, a phone number and, and text message service as well. Um, so every single plan has a dedicated phone number that all comes back into that one project website. So at the end of the day, um, we have um, a large um, body of transcribed materials, whether they be written or whether they be called in from community members who are interested in being part of the plan. Um, it gives us an opportunity to call members back, especially some of our older adults um, who are less familiar or less comfortable with new online engagement tools. Um, but we're also able to text folks. So if um, somebody doesn't have access to a computer or the survey is a little bit um, cumbersome for whatever device they're on, they're able to text us and we, we can provide those survey questions them via text I and mean, the charge is on us. So again, it, it should and hopefully be an accessible process for folks to be able to participate. Um, so this has really been the engagement platform and tool that we've leveraged over the past year and a half that we've been doing um, engagement work. And we'll be taking this tool with us as we start to move into more of that hybrid uh, model that I'm sure many of us have been thinking about. Um, and as Debbie said, we also have been using our OP engagement channels. Um, we have our, our Twitter and Instagram, and we also have a newsletter um, that goes out every month that gives folks updates on, our, on the plans that um, are ongoing. I will say one thing that we've tried um, this year in regards to Twitter is um, we're trying to be a little bit more friendly online. So that means tagging folks who are really engaged or are those stakeholders and leaders that we've developed over time, try to tag them in our posts. Um, so that way they understand like this is for them, this is for their community and they're able to share it on their networks as well. Um, and that's been a really great resource for us in terms of just information sharing um, and trying to get the message out outside of the folks who just follow OP on Twitter because that is a select group. Next, please. Great. Um, so we also have all of our physical engagement tools. Um, one thing that we've been able to deploy over the past year are dedicated gift cards. Um, we want to make sure that we're paying people for their time, um, for their thoughts, and for their leadership. Um, and so this past year, we've been able to provide gift cards to project partners. So those are those community um, community leaders that I talked about earlier. And um, we've been able to pay um, folks who are helping to facilitate our meetings, who are helping to spread the word about our meetings, who actually go out and collect information and then share that back with us. So we've been able to pay people for that, um, but we've also paid our youth leaders. So what we've done this past year um, is every plan that we have, we've brought on a youth intern um, who's been really helpful in sort of thinking about how youth want to engage with the planning process. Um, and we've been able to pay them when they've when they've shown great leadership and when they've gone out to the community and actually started doing that dynamic youth engagement. Uh, for every plan, we've also done community-wide mailers. And um, we know that while our online engagement tool is, is great, um, and we're able to email folks, there's a lot of people who don't check email. There's a lot of people who are not connected um, to us digitally. So what we try to do is send out a community-wide mailer multiple times to every single household um, and mailing address in our planning areas. Um, while we still know that's not going to reach everybody, um, it's, a, it's another way for us to check in and make sure that people are at least somewhat informed about the planning work that we're doing. 
Um, like Debbie said, we also have our meeting in a box, um, which has been really great to, to leverage with all the community partners that we've been able to, to work with over the past year. Um, in particular, we've worked with Main Streets, we've worked up with pop-up retailing groups um, and other sort of organizations that are really excited about the planning work that we do. Um, and so in those partnerships, we've been able to sort of um, pass on some of the um, engagement tools that we have learned, but also the information about the plans. So they're able to conduct that, that, that engagement as well on our behalf. Like Debbie said, we also have a lending library, um, which again has been really, really great um, in our partnerships with our community organizations. Um, and then the last thing is we've uh, created alternative meeting times. So oftentimes our meetings are late. Um, folks are trying to eat dinner. They're trying to get their kids into bed. They're doing work that they weren't able to do during the day. And um, we know it's difficult to get online um, at seven o'clock or six o'clock at night. So what we've also tried to do um, is make sure that we're available during the day. So folks who are not working, you know, a, a typical nine to five, um, but have different shift work hours can join us at 10 a.m. or at 2 p.m. Um, to be able to get that same information that we'd be providing later in the evening. So now what I want to talk about some of the, the new things that we've done this past year. Um, I know that many of us have um, been trying to pilot new engagement tactics, especially in light of the pandemic. Um, and as we're re-entering um, into the, the engagement world, um, thinking about ways that we can start scaling these pilot engagement tactics. So the first thing I want to talk about is how we've been leveraging our community partners. Um, we've really worked very hard to um, build relationships with communities on the ground that are already doing really incredible work. Um, oftentimes, they are our leaders that we get to almost follow in their footprints. Um, so one of the ways in which we've worked um, with our community partners this year has been through collaborative grant making. We've leveraged um, grants that, that we've gotten um, um, and used our grant making authority um, to be able to provide additional funding and capacity to um, community groups on the ground. Um, so in particular, um, one plan that we're working on right now is for Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast. Um, that's from the base of the Sousa Bridge all the way to Southern Avenue, if you're familiar with um, with DC. And we've been able to provide grants to the Main Street organization, um, to a, a, a retail pop-up group, um, and then also to local artists to help lead um, really dynamic um, retail pop-ups in uh, dynamic engagement opportunities, um, and then also create some more physical presence um, along the planning area that respond to some of the, the challenges that we've heard from community members. Um, and this has been really great to even connect um, those groups together as they will likely take on some of the implementation work that we have teed up in our plans. Um, the second thing that we do is we convene our interagency and community partners together. Um, so what we're trying to do here is um, help sort of think through, are there contracting opportunities that local organizations can start taking on to make our, our work hyper-local and hyper-responsive um, to what we're hearing through community engagement. Um, we also help and uh, try to facilitate interagency and community-wide meetings. Um, so like I said before, we know that there's a huge burden on community members um, as they're trying to be engaged with an OP process, with a uh, parks and recreation process, with uh, you name the agency process. And so what we try to do um, is work across our different agencies to understand if, if there's overlap, um, how can we best um, be synergized so that there's less burden on community members so they just have to join one meeting and get all the information they need that's relevant and pertinent to their, their spaces. Um, and last but not least, we try to be strategic thought partners with, with our community members. Um, so there are some groups um, in the city that are leading really, really cool um, ward-based planning efforts. Um, so what we're able to do there is sort of um, attach ourselves to that ward-based planning effort and share data that we're collecting from the smaller plan process with those ward-based plans and, and have that information go um, back and forth and be a little bit more dynamic. Um, similarly, we do that with our Main Street organizations and other organizations that are leading in the same sort of um, planning areas that we're doing work in. This helps with ground truthing as well, um, because oftentimes we know that there is um, a specific subset of the population that's really invested in planning um, that are maybe not as or are more engaged with other um, planning work that's going on outside of district government. And so that um, dynamic uh, data sharing is really helpful just to make sure that we're actually going in the right direction and are being maybe misled by a handful of voices. 
Um, and last but not least, they just help build capacity for plan implementation. Um, so because we're able to bring on community partners rather early on in the planning process, they're able to start to own some of the recommendations and the implementation that we want to see come out of this plan, um, which has been really incredible. Um, and, and it makes our job a little bit easier as we go into the council process or any sort of um, legislative process around um, finalizing and codifying our small area plans. Um, so the next piece is youth engagement. So Debbie sort of teed this up. Um, we've been working with our youth a lot more. Um, we know that our youth probably know our cities better than we do. Um, and so through all of our small area planning work, uh, we've tried to bring on um, a youth intern to help give another voice and another lens to how we do planning. Um, we've noticed that they think our planning is sometimes a little bit stale. Um, and so they've been able to provide really great insights in terms of how we could do um, more effective online and digital engagement. How can we better um, connect with folks on the ground? Specifically, um, we, for every small area plan that we have, we also have an advisory committee group, um, which is made up of um, community leaders and, and community stakeholders. We've tried to bring on youth into this advisory group. Um, so we've worked with the local Boys and Girls Club, um, and they've been incredible partners. Um, they, they've actually helped facilitate some of our um, public facing community uh, meetings, and then also led an in-person youth pop-up. Um, equally, we have had dedicated youth events. So that youth pop-up I just mentioned, um, we really tried to work with the Boys and Girls Club and our youth interns to just put the word out to all the, the youth that were uh, specifically in Congress Heights to come on out, tell us their ideas, tell us their thoughts, tell us what they wanted to see um, in, in Congress Heights moving forward. Um, we use chalk, we use dynamic um, tools to, to really try to make um, planning a little bit more fun and a little bit more accessible. Um, and last but not least, um, we try to incorporate play as much as we can into our um, the pop-ups that we've been doing, especially this past year as we've been going back out into community. Um, so some of the things that we've done is we've worked with American University, the Game Lab, and I'll get into that a little bit more, um, but they led a really great um, ice cream and listening tour um, where they wanted to capture community voices, um, but in exchange, they wanted to make sure that folks were getting free ice cream. Um, and so it was a fun mutual exchange where kids were really excited to provide their feedback because of course they got sweets, um, but also then we got really great um, feedback and we have a great tool now of, of consolidated um, conversations that we've had with community members. Equally, um, we've bought a lot of fun games for our office that um, we sometimes play, but also <laughs> folks um, on the ground like to play as well. Um, so by bringing the uh, Legos out, by bringing out that parachute, I don't know if you all remember from gym class where you would lift up the parachute and kids would run underneath. By doing that, um, we're able to stand side by side with other members of the community and have conversations with them while their kids are maybe playing with Legos, playing with the parachute, playing with Jenga, and so on and so forth. Um, so making the planning process and our events a little bit more engaging and a little bit more um, exciting. It, it, I think it's really helped in terms of just um, providing us with um, better entry points for conversation. Um, so the next piece about you know some of the piloting that we've done um, is working with university and anchor institutions. Um, so I sort of just teased out that we've been working with American University, their game lab, um, to think about really different and engaging um, engagement tactics that we could be using on the ground. One of the things that they did, and I might try to play a video if we have enough time, um, is an ice cream and listening tour. And so um, American University, they have um, a, an engagement or a humanities truck rather that you can see in the top two images. Um, and they drove their truck around one of the planning areas that we're doing work in, again, Pennsylvania Avenue. And they stopped at a handful of different locations. And all they were trying to do was just interview folks. They wanted to hear their stories, their narrative about what the corridor was, what it means to them and what they want to see in the future. Um, and in exchange, they gave out ice cream. Um, and this really, I think, um, captured sort of a, a, a a spirit that we're, sometimes the Office of Planning is not able to do um, because we're not able to give out free food, um, but a university is. And so by doing that, um, they were this third party um, that was able to really have great conversation with folks. Um, equally, they helped us think about um, how to incorporate gaming and play into collecting data. Um, so they, they um, have a, a gaming uh, lens that they take to all of their surveying and all of their data collection. Um, and so we put together a recommendation survey, um, at least I call it a survey, they call it a game, but it involved using dice, it involved um, using your cell phones, it involved using QR codes. Um, it was more of a scavenger hunt format where folks got to decide what information they wanted to provide, whether it was on transportation, whether it was on housing, um, roll the dice and, and provide their priorities for the future, um, which I think, again, was another sort of low um, barrier to entry way to provide feedback um, into the planning process. 
Um, so what I'm going to do now, oh, and then the last thing they did, I, I apologize, they worked across with all of our community partners um, to help um, develop a dynamic um, uh, web page that connects with on the ground physical tools. So what we did was we used our grant making authority, um, we worked with local artists who helped provide some wayfinding along the corridor. The wayfinding also had a QR code associated with it. Um, if somebody went to go scan that QR code, it went to a website that American University created for us. Um, on that website was a bit of story and context about what uh, what the place meant, what the um, the the feeling of that place meant to community members. So for instance, um, there's a QR code in front of one of the shopping centers along Pennsylvania Avenue. And it tells a bit of the story about um, commerce and retail along Pennsylvania Avenue over the past 50 plus years. Um, and that's been another really uh, great sort of digital and um, in-person uh, engagement tool. So if we have enough time, I'm gonna go ahead and try and play. Um, this video so you all can hear the recordings and, and the I think the success that came out of the ice cream and listening tour. What do residents of Penn Avenue East think about their neighborhood? A half million dollars are on the line as DC government thinks about a new area plan and a main streets program. This July, we offered free ice cream to residents and stakeholders who wanted to share their story. I drove our nifty humanities truck out to three different spots in the neighborhood to listen to residents. Here are some of their stories. Throughout the summer, I come down here and work and watch the youth summer camps mm -hmm. uh, just flood this place. They'll go swimming, and then yeah. they'll come down here skate, and then they'll go back swimming. Okay. Um, so, born and raised. Yeah. It has a lot of culture and a lot of family orientation around here. Uh, and this one street is where all the action happens. Because People here that I've met are nice. I love the library system here, which is why I'm here today. Just to relax, enjoy my weekend all. Look at the scenery. The old and the new and the same. Just enjoy. You see people working out and stuff like that all the time and really doing it in groups. Like yeah. that's what makes this area so great is the intertwining of the different individuals and the communities. Places for the kids to play, like a playground. I feel like there aren't close enough playgrounds. Like don't get me wrong, there are plenty of playgrounds in the city, but you gotta travel to get to them. Just more easily accessible, just public activities for kids. So when I think about a grocery store, if you live right there in that area, where would you go to the grocery store at? Mm -hmm. I don't feel like there's a close enough grocery store. Places where we can get good food at a good price, like everywhere else. There are no Harris Teeters or Trader Joe's on this side. It's just like IGAs and food rights and the stuff in there is not, it's not acceptable. It's really not. It's like days away from being spoiled. Produce is not like you would see on the other side. Even the variety of things they don't have on this side making sure that it's not like a food desert. You know, I, I talked about the, the farmer's market because you do have to travel quite a ways sometimes to get to a good grocery store that's got fresh produce and not just everything that's in cans and in bags and in the frozen food aisles. You spoke about economic and housing and those things are great but I think a lot of times in this area where people start throwing around words like revitalization and economic stimulation it all sounds like gentrification housing is always great but usually like I said I'm from Baltimore I'm from in the city so it's like yeah that revitalization that came to downtown Baltimore ended up in a lot of the people specifically people of color, black people that were living down there being pushed out because the houses that came, they couldn't afford those houses. And then a lot of young white kids that were going to University of Maryland or John Hopkins or whatever came and moved right on in. And now it doesn't even look like what it once was. So I think that's a lot of the fear, honestly. It's like, sure, do we want housing? Yeah. Do we want affordable housing? Yeah. Do we want affordable housing for us? That's what we want. But I think the people that are really making 
So I'm going to go ahead and pause it there. There's a lot more, um, but I think one of the things that is a big takeaway for us is while we do all this different type of engagement work, um, having the local voice in our heads as we do this work is really important. Um, and so part of what we're going to talk about next is the evaluation piece. And so part of you know taking in the, the transcribed data, taking in the, the physical um, qualitative data and the quantitative data, um, we try to put that all together to really represent the narrative that our community partners and, and our community members are saying. Um, so my colleague Ashley, she's going to talk a bit more about the evaluation piece, um, but the way in which that we've been able to gather lots of different feedback and lots of different data um, is all part of how we're measuring our success um, in terms of making sure that we're reaching a really broad audience. Um, so thank you for indulging me with, with sharing that, um, that recording. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to do this quick. So, so. So I'm going to try to do the evaluation piece kind of quickly because um, I'm we're actually more interested in questions um, from you guys and, and you know the things that you might uh, want to inquire about in terms of engagement. Um, I'm kind of more interested in that, so I'll kind of run this quickly. Um, I think one of the things when you're doing engagement that everyone is concerned about is the end result, right? What was the evaluation measures? What were the metrics to prove that our engagement was successful? Or how do we deem if our engagement was successful? Um, so there are a lot of, you know, evaluation tactics or tools that you can use. Um, for us, one of the things that we look at heavily is because we don't do implementation. Um, on a you know large scale, we have to coordinate and work with other agencies to get some of the things done um, for engagement um, in, in terms of implementation. Um, but another thing that we heavily kind of you know look at when we're talking about evaluation um, is our data, and so we rely heavily on surveys. I know you know we do all types of surveys, whether it's written, whether it's virtual, whether we drop it in the chat and have people send it back to us. Um, even for like our comp plan process, we did uh, surveys, but we actually mailed them out like Faith was talking about and had them send back you know, their results to us. Um, but we have a lot of data collection from surveys. And another thing that you know, we do heavily is research. Um, we have looked at so many other jurisdictions and how they do evaluation and some of the, the metrics that they use. Um, and one of the things that we also look at heavily is you know, community validation. Um, what's the ongoing feedback? What do we hear when we come back to the office and synthesize that information and go back and take it to the community? We want to make sure that what we heard is what they said. Um, because sometimes you do have, you know, that mesh where you come back to the office and you synthesize it and stuff and you go back out and they're like, that's not what we said. That's not how we feel. Um, and so our point is to make sure that we are um, in conjunction with the community and we're working hand in hand with them to pro provide what they want, not what we want as the government. And that's very important to us um, personally and, and as OP employees. Um, another thing that we do really heavily is we work with, you know, our internal and external uh, folks. And so, you know, that, that may mean us going and talking to someone in historic preservation. That may mean us talking to someone in development review. You know, that may mean us calling someone over at DHCD or WASA or, you know, whomever. But having that um, repository of folks that you can call and work with for resources, for information sharing, um, is very valuable to us and to our engagement process. Um, we're, we're not able to, you know, get a lot of the things done just as a team of five, four. So, so you know, those interconnections um, are very important for us. Um, so some of the evaluation steps, um, as you guys can see, I don't, I don't really like, you know, reading everything off of the screen. So, you know, we do iterating, growing, engagement capacity, um, and also building and share resources, which is what I kind of explained or discussed. Um, we have some tools where we like to, you know, develop roadmaps. Um, but something that we're kind of getting into more these days um, are uh, legacy maps or road maps or um, what are these maps that we're using now? Uh, storytelling maps, sorry, storytelling maps. Um, and, and we've actually kind of navigated to those borders a little bit because they, it just, it looks so good um, presentation wise, but it also data wise gets a lot of information out and it hits a lot of the points. Um, that we're trying to make for folks. And they're able to take that, you know, and look at that and pass that along to folks and have their own conversations. Um, and that's another thing with evaluation that, you know, may not be talked about as much. 
evaluation doesn't necessarily always have to be, you know, the internal, what we heard you said type of situation. It could be, you know, them needing their own meetings and having their own conversations about things in their community and then coming back to us and saying, this is what we discussed, this is how we see it, and this is what we want. And um, when you're coming together, you know, as a community, it's a lot stronger um, than just that one person's voice, right? Um, who's saying, I don't want this or I want that. Um, so those are some of the things that we look at. We go to the next. We go to the next. <laughs> so let's talk. Uh, this is a great time to hear from you guys. We want to uh, talk about some of the, you know, engagement things that, you know, or questions that we have, you know, what's your greatest challenges? Um, how did you guys overcome it? How were your greatest successes? Things that you may be proud of? Um, this is the time where we kind of do our, you know, collection of working together just to hear from you guys and see what, you know, matters to you. And maybe we can also take some of those points in also and work with those internally as well. Yeah, so um, I just posted for um, our participants and I know planners out there are constantly engaging the community. So please be submitting your questions. I'll kick one off here um for you and I, I like that you also opened it up to even stories so if someone's got uh something they want to share uh to the broader community i know virtually it's a little bit harder to do this than when we're in person but um, we're going to make it work so a question for you um one of the things that uh that i have actually faced uh more recently is we've noticed it feels like uh, engagement fatigue or um, some of our communities feel oversaturated with community engagement. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you go about preventing or combating engagement fatigue, what some of your approach or tips and tricks might be when you either observe that or feel that that might be happening in your community or you observe it with the planners, right? Who feel like their project is being over engaged. So um, I'll open that discussion up for the three of you while others, please submit your questions while they're answering this one. I'll go ahead and take a, a, a start, but feel free to add on. Um, so yes, definitely. We're, I think a lot of folks feel engagement fatigue in the office, outside the office, no matter who you are. Um, so one thing that we've tried doing is piggybacking on events that are taking place in, in the communities in which we're doing planning work. Um, so two weekends ago, Debbie and I went to, um, there was a community day in, along Pennsylvania Avenue that the, the church, um, one of the churches was hosting. And, and we just showed up and we did our engagement work there um, because we knew folks were gonna be there. Um, and so what we did is we just had one poster where folks, if they wanted to provide some comments they could. If they wanted to just play with the Legos, they could. If they wanted to take a postcard and keep moving, they could do that too. Um, so trying not to force any sort of um, intense engagement approach on anyone, um, I think is something that we've been trying to do. Um, but equally, we've been trying to create spaces where people can just sort of walk through um, and, and learn about the planning work that we did. So actually in, in the slide that you're looking at, um, all the way to the left, um, you see a, a, an alley um, where um, I think it's children were, were uh, playing with chalk and, and providing feedback. Um, this was different than our youth engagement that I talked about earlier. Um, this was an alley activation. And so what we did was um, there's some, uh, there were posters that you're unable to see in this photo, but there are posters about what alleys could be like in the future. And the prompt was, tell us what you wanna see in alleys um, moving forward. And so folks were able to learn about the planning process and then also just like have a good day, like a good Saturday. Um, and I think that's something that has maybe helped a little bit um, in terms of getting over um, it, uh, engagement fatigue. Um, I can't speak for engagement fatigue in the office because I know that we all run on coffee and are always a little bit sleepy. Um, but I think that having being able to work with a team in the office, I think is really helpful. Um, whenever we've done engagement where it's just like a, a single planner out or one or two planners out, it's a lot more exhausting just because you have so many resources you have to bring um, and it's just a lot of work. Um, but I think having a dynamic team that's able to tap in and tap out as appropriate um, has been really helpful for me. And I'll say, I think honestly, one of, I also work with the Food Policy Council, um, and one of the things that we do, which, you know, you can't replicate in every project, but 
do we really need to meet? You know, what what it, what are we meeting about? You know, are we just meeting for the sake of meeting? And and when it comes to that, you know, we've done a few different things, whether it's, you know, to create a Google document where it's a working document and we don't need to meet this week. So everybody go in, look at this document. Is it updated? You need to add anything. Um, and then, you know, after we do that, we can come back in a week or two. Do we need to meet then? Um, those type of things. And also setting it up to where, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to come necessarily to get the information, but we could do videos and we post those videos on our website. And so instead of you actually having to come to a meeting, you're able to go to the website, public input, um, or whichever, you know, tool we may be using and look at the, the um, video that we've, you know, put up and you may be able to add comments or you may be able to do a survey that way. Um, so just thinking about having and also have other tools with engagement and not just always making it, you know, a meeting per se. Um, I just want to say a little bit about uh, staff fatigue. That is very, very critical, um, a very real issue. And my advice is don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, work with your colleagues well in advance to, to uh, determine what your staffing needs are going to be for the engagements that you have built into whatever project you're working on and schedule. So in September, I'm going to need three people. In October, I'm going to need five people and just schedule, uh, even right down to the hours, who can give me from 10 to 12, who can give me from two to five. And just so you'll have an idea, so you're not, first of all, on, on a limb by yourself. As they said, it's a lot of work. You all know, you gotta put up the table, you gotta do the tablecloth, you gotta set up the handouts. It's a lot of work. And then you gotta pack it all in and take it wherever you take it at the end of the day. So just don't be afraid to ask for help. That's great, really good tips. So we got a lot of questions coming in. Do you want me to take them one by one for y'all or do you, have you picked out one you, okay. Um, so the first one we got in. You got it, so just guide us. I'll, I'll post them for you, yeah. So here's a question um, from a participant. What are the contents of the meeting in a box? Uh, they really like the concept, but they're not sure how you determine what goes into the box. Okay, so I can do that. I know um, for our purposes, we actually were doing a comprehensive plan. And so our meeting in the box for that particular um, plan was all of the documents that we, you know, had passed out or distributed, um, whether it was one pagers, I know we had um, the roadmap, we had maps, um, we had a uh, notepad, we had a uh, pencil, paper, we had an envelope for them to mail back comments to us. I'm sorry, I'm closing my mouth, but I'm running things down in my mind. I <laughs> do it my eyes closed. Um, we had uh, uh, all of the area elements in the box for them to pull, um, and even contacts. We had a spreadsheet with all of the planners' names um, listed so they could contact a particular planner. So it really depends on that particular project, but we actually did order boxes and we put them together and we allowed the ANC commissioners or organizations, that's kind of how we did it. Um, we, we didn't necessarily, not that a single person couldn't come and get a meeting in a box, but it was really more so about taking this box and having your own planning meeting with your own folks and residents. Because at that time, you know, we were getting some feedback about, you know, our voices versus their voices and, you know, what they said versus what we heard and all these other things. And so it was a great idea to say, well, plan, you know, have this meeting and plan it your way. Do your own you know planning meeting and if you have questions if you need assistance we're here for you but this is something you can guide yourself so it's really i think based on your project and what you feel should go you know inside that box to those constituents great thank you um, we got a lot of good questions, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. Here's another one from a participant who is working on a small area plan where there are groups in long-standing conflict with each other. Do you have any suggestions on effective engagement approaches in that particular situation? I think a lot of planners are probably uh, grinning right now thinking about their own favorite <laughs> engagement uh, groups that are at conflict. So what do you think about that? Uh, I'm going to speak to that, and even as I think about some of my most difficult small area planning, uh, I'm getting the hairs are raising on the back of my neck. It's like, um, but what we did was extend the outreach. We held more meetings, more localized meetings within that particular community, and I'm not going to name them. But it's just basically exhaust the conversation. 
We also had facilitators, not OP staff, but we had outside facilitators, professional facilitators. If in this particular case, it was very contentious. So we had to have help. And again, it's okay to ask for help. And those facilitators were seen as neutral parties. They didn't work for government, they weren't from the community or any faction within the community. And they really did help to neutralize what could have been a very toxic situation. And we were able to get to common ground. You're not gonna get everybody to agree on everything, but you can, everybody can get a little bit of what they want. And that's kind of where we move forward with the small area planning process at that time. So everybody could see themselves in the plan. Everybody got some of what they wanted. And so far, I mean, this is probably 10 years down the road, the actual uh, building and uh, placemaking, all the efforts that, are that, have been, that were spoken about in that plan are coming to fruition. And generally the community seems to be good with it. And one thing I'll add um, that also may be helpful is trying to understand the priorities of the different groups and deputize them to make them leaders in the things that they care most about. Um, and so we there's a few different uh, groups that are coming to mind that are really, really passionate about, one is really passionate about transportation, one is really passionate about retail, one is really passionate about housing opportunities, and trying to make them their own leaders in those fields while we're doing planning. So at the end of the day, they can say, this is how I contributed, um, and take ownership of it. So I think you're not rubbing heads per se, but you are um, giving people the space to be their own leaders and, and provide the feedback that they kind of hold near and dear to their own hearts. And I'll just add really quickly to, um, I know one of the things now, I'm not sure how contentious the group is and some of the things you may have, but we actually have forced people to be together because what we have found is that the contentious people stick together and sometimes their voices are so loud that the people who, you know, may not want to you know say anything because of these voices won't and so what we've done um on distributing materials or the agenda we write numbers on the agenda and you have to sit with the per the number that's so all the ones sit together the two sit together three. so then you now have someone at your table that you don't even know or you know you may have never had a conversation with and now you can have that conversation of what you know what are your issues because a lot of times you know the contentious person because they're so loud everyone feels like oh that's the issue and it may not very well be it's that one person right who has that issue and the other people in the group may not have that at all so i think sometimes you know kind of removing that one loud you know person who's taking over the meeting and kind of saying no we're going to mix this up we're going to you know you guys have to sit with other people that you don't normally sit with or you may not normally converse with i think that's helped us too with some of our processes it's really great, it's really great. Thank you for that advice. So um, we've got a few questions that have come in uh, and naturally, right? Thinking about the last year and a half we've been through on thinking through COVID and virtual engagement. And there seems to be, I'm gonna try to combine them a little bit and just have you talk um, generally about them. There seems to be a few themes to the, uh, the question. So one, has it like increased participation um, or, or the numbers that you've seen um, in the community? Two, has it uh, skewed participation? So houses that are either able to or more likely to participate, or is it maybe given a, a, a chance for broader representation um, in community events? And then Three um, is kind of getting to those, but then specifically looking for uh, rather than anecdotal evidence, if we actually have any like data that's helping us uh, prove this. So um, I'll open that up for discussion. So um, from, it's interesting that that question or was asked in terms of virtual engagement, uh, does it, did it increase participation? And I have an article in my uh, notes from Governing Magazine that suggests that it really doesn't increase participation. I, I have an issue with that because from what I've seen anecdotally, uh, if there is broader participation, more cross-cutting participation, but maybe the numbers kind of fluctuate. And I think the numbers fluctuate because for the virtual meetings, we're able to record those and post those after the fact. So in the moment, we may not have as much participation as maybe we'd like, but people have the opportunity, as Faith said earlier, I and mean, it's there 24 seven for folks to go back and um, participate, review, respond to. 
Um, I, um, I can share that link to Governing Magazine in, in case anyone is interested in reading that and maybe contesting that as I do. Um, but it was, it was an interesting fact and I really thank you for that question. Um, I'll let my colleagues speak to that as well. Yeah, I think part of the barriers and the hurdles that we've had this year is like the meeting circle is the meeting circle, right? So folks who are really tapped into their own civic associations, to um, their um, ANC meetings, so whatever that the meeting circle is, they know what's coming up. They know about the smaller year plans. They know about our, what our colleagues are doing at other agencies, and they're able to be hyper-focused, hyper-tapped in. And I think part of the challenge is both virtually and in person is like getting outside of that that, that same group of people. And so I think virtually we're able to do that a little bit more because we're just able to share a link and folks can hop in and hop, hop out. They can make dinner while they're participating in the meeting. Their, their kids can be online with them. Um, but I think there's you're gonna have the same sort of folks show up over and over again, um, both in person and, and, ex, and uh, online. And it's just a matter of, of how much, it takes a lot of legwork uh, to get other people involved, um, especially on the online format. Absolutely. So um, one final question here, and then we are closing out at the end of the hour. To the individual who asked about uh, engagement around Black Lives Matter Plaza, I would recommend that you go to our website um, and look at the YouTube. You can. We actually had a presentation specifically on uh, memorials and the commemorative landscape across DC where the project manager um, and I think engagement manager talked about that effort. So I won't ask that question. Um, the final question will be a kind of quick one. Any resources or tips on how to stay updated on community events in the DC region or volunteer opportunities too? And, and I had listed, is there a place where all of the engagement opportunities are kind of listed or a community calendar that's easy to see uh, from DCOP's website or something? Yeah, there's a few different places. So from like uh, from across the district, you can always go to the mayor's calendar and there's lots of different events there. Um, going back to what we were talking about before on publicinput.com, um, lots of other agencies besides Office of Planning use that platform now. Um, so we have a standalone website, um, I think it's engage.dc.gov, where all the different public input uh, or the plans that we're hosting on public input, they can all be reached um, through there. Um, so if you really want to focus on the planning work that we talked about, um, engage.dc gov is the best place. Um, otherwise, you could always head to the Office of Planning website, which is planning.dc.gov. Great. Um, well, that seems like a pretty good uh, and fitting end to our session today. Um, and I see some other sharing stuff. So thank you. Um, the three of you for putting together a very engaging and informative session. I know I personally have learned a lot and um, and enjoyed this session. To all of our attendees, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. One final session of our conference that's live. That's this afternoon at four o'clock. It is a one and a half hour session because that law credit is 1.5 CM. So um, if you need your law credit, uh, that's happening this afternoon and we look forward to seeing you there. Otherwise, have a great uh, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.